Welcome to the Rebus Community and Open Textbook Network Office Hours. We are delighted to collaborate on these monthly conversations together to bring all of you together as a community of open textbook collaborators and practitioners. As many of you know, in these sessions, we talk informally about issues in open textbook publishing. As a reminder, these conversations are community driven and are one way that we can think and work together on support and solutions. So please let us know if there are topics that you would like to explore in future sessions. I would now like to introduce my colleague Zoe at Rebus. Thanks, Karen. Hi, everyone. Wonderful to see everybody here today um, and in good numbers too, uh, showing up for this one, which is great to see. Um, for those of you who may not have encountered the Rebus community before, uh, we are developing uh, tools and resources to support collaborative and community driven open textbook publishing. Uh, so we've been working very hands on with about 35 projects all around the world and in all sorts of subjects uh, to really kind of draw out learning um, what we can learn from the process and turn that into a replicable, replicable publishing process that others can then uh, can use and adapt to their contexts. Um, and as Karen says, these, uh, these office hours are a wonderful place for us to explore some of the issues that come up uh, within the community and, and really engage with them and, and what we find to be really fascinating and interesting ways. Uh, and so for today's session, we're very pleased to, to be handing over to OTN uh, to be talking about some of the work that they've been working very hard on, we know for, for many months. Um, so this is a great moment uh, to be able to hear about that uh, for all of us here. So I'll hand back to Karen and Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. <clears throat> I appreciate that. So my name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Managing Director with the Open Textbook Network. The network is a community of almost 800 institutions working together to move higher education towards open. And today's format for office hours is going to be a little bit different than our usual because, as Zoe alluded to, we're very excited to announce a new open textbook publishing curriculum and are dedicating this session to a module within that curriculum. And the module is called Defining Textbook Structure and Elements. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the curriculum what we're going to talk about today, introduce Dave, and he'll finally take it away. So um, just a little bit more about the Open Textbook Publishing Curriculum. It is open to everyone online as an asynchronous experience. And in addition, OTN members will have access to synchronous support around the curriculum, much like today's talk. And this curriculum was developed as part of our publishing cooperative pilot. The co-op includes teams from nine institutions working together to grow open textbook publishing expertise in higher ed and, of course, produce open textbooks. And so some of the content that you'll find is specific to the methodology we're experimenting with in the co-op. But however, the vast majority of the content applies to publishing open textbooks through a variety of methodologies and programs. So it's not exclusive of any um, one particular method. I'd also like to say it's, of course, iterative, and we'll continue to build on it as we move forward in open textbook publishing as a community. So your feedback is always welcome. So I'm now going to introduce our topic and speaker. Many of you may wonder, what makes a textbook a textbook? They are, of course, fundamentally different from monographs and other publications, and it's really their structure that defines them. But how you define a consistent structure for the entirety of a textbook is a question and it's critical to students reading expectations and their learning. So how can project managers and authors work together to structure their textbook. And I keep saying the word structure because it's something we talk about a lot in the publishing co op. Um, so today we're going to learn about common instructional design elements found in textbooks and a methodology for working with authors to create a consistent structured textbook. So our guest, as many of you already know, is Dave Ernst. He's the Chief Information Officer in the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota. He's supervised instructional designers, curriculum designers, educational technologists there for more than 15 years. He has a PhD in Curriculum and Instruction and Learning Technologies from UMN and has worked in ed tech and curriculum design for 26 years. Dave is also the director of the Center for Open Education and the executive director of the OTN. So um, what we're gonna do today, Dave's gonna present the module and then we'll open it up for questions 
and, um, and discussion. So I'm going to put a link to the module in chat. This is what Dave is going to be uh, talking us through shortly. So Dave, I hand it over to you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am David Ernst. It's exciting to see so many familiar names on the list of people here. Um, I want to start just by saying how much I really appreciate these office hours and the partnership we have with Rebus on this. And this is what the open education community needs to be doing more of, is talking with each other, sharing with each other the expertise. Uh, as Karen mentioned, what I'm going to talk about today is iterative. It's in progress. It's something we've learned that we just want to share. It is in no way perfect. It's no way a solution for everybody who's ever going to be publishing a textbook. It's what we've learned works well and is a tool that we use and a process we use um, uh, working with faculty and helping them create something that's that um, helping them create something that they uh, a textbook that they can envision that's good. So um, so anyway, I want to start off with that and thank you all for for coming here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, is basically, um, you know, the Open Textbook Network really started out with uh, focused on adoptions of open textbooks and open textbooks that that already exist, right? And so they're out there, they're kind of the low hanging fruit. But as we've traveled around, ran workshops for faculty, um, talked with um, staff, librarians, and so on at institutions, it became clear there was a real appetite for publishing as well. And so we have spent the last probably two and a half years trying to get a better understanding of what it takes to publish a textbook. And we are definitely still learning. Uh, and, and a large degree of thanks goes to all of the institutions we're working with is in, and the cooperative and the other institutions we've talked with that have helped us understand this. So, so what I'm gonna talk about today comes from uh, some of that digging deep into the actual in the dirt, uh, on the ground, I guess, might be a cleaner way of saying that, on their ground discussions we've had with faculty about what they need and what, and um, about publishing a textbook. So it's a very um, kind of a step-by-step -step process uh, that um, I'm going to walk through here. If you've opened up uh, the module, I, what I'm going to do is just kind of walk through it and try to explain it and how it works and why it works. Um, I'm also going to share my screen here, so hopefully this is working okay. Okay, good. Um, and so again, uh, I'll, I'll put a plug in for this open uh, uh, curriculum that uh, many people have worked hard on, Karen in particular that's out here and this is just one little piece of it. So please, uh, we're putting it out there for the open community, please use it. Uh, so this particular process came from working with about 15 different instructors a couple of years ago, over the last two years, I guess, uh, and trying to help them design uh, textbooks. One thing that we discovered uh, early on, which, is probably obvious uh, to most of you, but if, if oftentimes if you, if you ask a faculty to write, they will write. They will write what they know and they'll put it all down perfect. It's exact, you know, that's, that's what we ask them to do. If we want it to be a textbook, that's a different thing. That's an additional thing, right? So um, just want to point out as Karen first asked that question, you know, you're probably, uh, ask the question, what makes a textbook a textbook? Um, I'd like to know the answer to that question. I don't have a really great answer to it, uh, but I, I guess I would say that basically it is this content, but wrapped in it is actually instructional design, okay? Like my, my PhD program was in curriculum and instruction. They, they name it that way because curriculum and instruction are two different things. Curriculum is you can think of as content, is what you want students to know, and instruction is the process of teaching it. A textbook is primarily, we think of it primarily as curriculum, as content, right? Um, but what makes a textbook a textbook, I think, is the attempt to design the textbook in a way that helps students learn, right? And so 
this first diagram up on the top here really is a, it's just a simple uh, uh, illustration of that. You can see a monograph on the left, which is just the content dumped on the page. And the book has some structure to it. It probably has chapters and might have sections to it, but then it's just content. It's just the written word. If you look on the right, that's the, the OpenStax biology book. That's one page. That's the first page of chapter one. What things there are helping students learn? Look at that. See how many things you can pick out that are helpful for learning. A big part of, 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 of learning is context and structure, is understanding um, how this piece of something that I'm going to learn fits into the larger context of this field or this, uh, this, this uh, what I'm going to be taught. So if you look at this, they use everything from font size, font color, the styling, the styling within the, you see the chapter outline there is in a box, it's in a green box, and then it basically gives you the outline of what's to come in the chapter. Um, there is an introduction, which is just basically setting you up. Here's what you're going to be learning. There are learning objectives. There is an image here. There's all the content, frankly, that pretty much everything on this page is structure to help students learn. The content itself about the study of life isn't even on this page, really. These are just summaries, structures, and so on. Okay. So what we found is that faculty generally need help getting from a monograph to a textbook getting from simply content to content and structure, content and structure that helps students learn. And what we found is what I'm gonna go over here today, not only provides structure to get to a textbook that helps students learn, but the structure also at the same time will help faculty write. It will help kind of, um, you know, your work is cut out for you phrase, it basically helps kind of cut out their work for them, giving them a structure to kind of work within. Okay, so um, here we go. So let's start with the simple highest level structure of a textbook. And that's the first question we'll sit down and ask, what do you want this textbook to look like? What do you imagine it's gonna have? And so if we start at um, the book obviously being the highest level, the whole book, the whole, the book is going to be broken up into what pieces. And so you can see three different options here, right? You can just say a book has chapters and chapter has sections that were done, or a book might have units and a unit might have chapters and a chapter might have sections and a sections might have subsections or any variation of those things. It's a pretty easy decision, pretty simple decision, but it's something that we'll just start with so that we have this very highest level book structure that, stu that um, we ask instructors to identify, okay? Um, once that's identified, that then really defines the whole high level book, right? You have the book, the book has chapters, each chapter has sections, right? This would be an example of this first one, book, chapter, section. And you would have, this really illustrates just chapter one, but you would have that same tree structure then for each chapter, right? That's pretty obvious, okay. Okay, so you need to start with that because that's the high level. Structural elements then, these elements are really the interesting part. And these are, these are the pieces that help students learn. These are the pieces that oftentimes per, perhaps without our assistance and kind of prompting, instructors might not think about, okay? So these instructional, these structural elements is what we're calling them, are the pieces that, for instance, we see in this, this uh, the OpenStax book here, that we will add to provide help in learning. And I've broken them up into three categories, what we call openers, we call closers, and then down here a little bit, integrated pedagogical devices. I think I should find a simpler name than that. Uh, but openers are basically things that you find at the beginning of a chunk of the textbook. So it could be a textbook has openers. Could be a chapter has openers. Could be a section has openers. Okay, so if you again look, if we look up at this example, 
every chapter in this biology book from OpenStax has a chapter outline, it has a banner image, it has an introduction, and it has these learning objectives that by the end of this unit, you will be able to, right? It's consistent across the whole book. That is what students expect. They expect a structure that's consistent, that'll help them learn. So, so it could be a, burning, a banner image, learning objectives, an introduction, so on. And there is a link here that'll bring you, if you click on this to a list of some common things that publishers will use for openers. Closers, similarly, are things that come at the end of a chunk. So it could be the end of the book, it could be at the end of a chapter, it could be at the end of a section or whatever. Uh, they could be review problems, a summary of the chapter, links to external resources, right? I mean, if you think about textbooks, you know you've seen all these things, right? And they usually are things that we think of as coming in the, in the back of the, uh, the textbook. Um, so if we think about the textbook, um, if we look at a chapter, for instance, if this is a chapter, the chapter might have an openers like learning objectives, introduction, focus questions, have the main content in some form. It might be broken up into sections. And then it will have some closers. Um, notice that this can happen again at multiple levels. Let's say the main content of this chapter is actually a section, is sections. The section itself then could have openers, closers, and main content, right? Should I be stopping for questions or uh, do we want to wait? The plan was to wait, but I see him rolling in. There is a question, Dave, on uh, evidence for the highly structured approach. And I think I may be able to track something down. So um, we'll put that question on hold, which Jonathan says is fine, if you wanna keep rolling on. Okay, is it, does that mean evidence as in evidence of its success? Yes, like okay. the, the structure of a textbook makes- um, Oh, right. yeah, yeah, okay, gotcha, okay. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I will take a quick stab at that, and I am no expert in textbook design. I mean, we, what I'm going to talk about today is lessons learned from working with faculty, really. But I will say that I've spent, um, I don't even know how many, a couple decades probably working on online courses. And there's a lot of research about structure in online courses. And the way we usually think, the way that instructional designers that I've been working with um, uh, their whole job is to, well, not a big part of their job of instructional design is to provide structure for online courses. And we know there's a ton of evidence there in online course design that that structure is helpful to students um, and facilitates their learning, helps them find the content, helps them put it within context of the other content. Um, and the way that we talk about textbooks oftentimes is I'll say, this is really like for two instructional designers who are used to designing online courses. This is really pretty much exactly like designing an online course, except the end result is not an online course. It is a digital textbook. It's just a different medium uh, when we're done. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop there with that. Um, these integrated pedagogical devices are really just elements that live that aren't openers and not closers, but are other pieces of content that are connected, that are within the main content of the, of the section, chapter, or whatever it happens to be. Oftentimes these pedagogical devices are intended, are, are, are um, focused on meeting some specific needs. Like for instance, um, the biography element. Oftentimes you'll see in a textbook, the biography, if maybe it's a biology textbook, it's a biography of a famous uh, biologist, or it's a biography of a biologist who's working in the field right now on something really interesting, or it's a biologist who, um, who can maybe connect with the students in the course for some reason. And so typically those biographies are really laid out there to show that these are people. These are people, I mean, they have some goals that they're trying to accomplish by putting this element in the book, right? A case study sometimes will, will, 
will say, if, if it will address the goal of saying, I want to take this content and I want to see how, to, well, how does that really work in the real world? A case study is exactly the element you'd want to show, okay, I know we just talked about all this abstract stuff. Here is a case study of what's of, of its application in the real world. So um, there are a number of different elements like this that, that we can integrate into the content. And, um, and again, they uh, will typically be there to provide extra insight or scaffold uh, some goals that we really want them students to understand. So again, there's a list of some common integrated pedagogical devices there. Okay, so so those are the those are that's the basics of what we're talking about here. We have these elements that we want to put in the textbook to help students learn. Right. The question is, how do we get authors to work with these things? And not only do we want them to work with them, but we want them to do it in, as, in a consistent way, right? The textbooks, um, part of the instructional design of the textbook is its consistency, chapter to chapter, section to section. Students know what to expect. They know that when they see the blue box with the blue heading, that those are, oh, those are learning objectives, or those are, right? It, it helps lower barriers to learning by um, providing this context. So, so here's what we did, and we, we've written this, um, I've, I've written this section to be technology agnostic. There's no technology involved in this except for uh, magical post-it notes invented right here in Minnesota. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is exactly what I, the, the technology that we use to work with the, fact, the instructors that I worked with. We sat down with them and had them um, structure their book in the way I'm going to show you here with sticky notes and it worked beautifully actually. Um, so we're going to start out like I like I said we're going to start out at the very highest level. We're just going to say please describe uh, the structure the the highest level structure of a book. So in this example book chapter sub, section subject and let's just say that that's what they decided they wanted to do. We would have them then look at each level, starting at the book level, and say, what elements do you want in this book? In the, in, in, at the book level, what elements at, live at the book level? And there are openers, there are closers, and then there's the main content. So for the book, in this example, the instructor wants to make sure there's a cover page, wants to make sure there's a table of contents. Some of these things are so basic, they hardly need mentioning, but it isn't unhelpful to actually have the instructor think about, I mean, just to be aware that this will exist on your book. And then at the end, they want an index and they want a glossary. Okay, pretty simple book structure, right? The next thing we would do then is go down to the chapter. So you notice that we include chapters in here and there might be 20 chapters, but we're just gonna put one placeholder chapter in there, right? That's where all the chapters are gonna live. And then we define what a chapter looks like. And in this example, the instructor says a chapter, I want a little intro paragraph. I want a chapter outline. I want to list the learning objectives. I want to list key terms up front. I want sections then. So those are all openers. Those are all things that at the beginning of every chapter, you'll have intro, chapter outline, objectives, and key terms. At the end of every chapter, you'll have discussion questions and case studies. And so we would then go to the section and we would do the same for the section, which would of course have subsections and every subsection then we would also define. And they might have openers, they might have closers and so on. So they're, um, you can see how the structure is building level by level, right? Okay, so, so far, we haven't even talked about the content of the book, right? We haven't talked about biology. We haven't talked about whatever this book is about. We're just saying, what are the pieces that you want? Um, I wanna add a caveat to this. I think we are way, I think we need a lot more work here in this area to attach these different elements to actual 
learning objectives and having elements that will address learning objectives specifically. Uh, right now, the way that we worked with these faculty is we kind of relied on them and their expertise to say, what pieces do you think will be useful to your students? We don't get into depth about why and what specifically, how is this gonna help them meet their learning objectives? I think we should go deeper in that area. Right now, uh, we need a little more work on that. Okay, so the next step that we went through then is basically content structure, right? We are working, um, uh, now we're gonna talk about the content. Um, in this case, let's talk about biology, for instance, right? So the term scope and sequence is usually more of a K-12 kind of word. I don't, I don't hardly ever hear it used uh, in higher education, but it basically the scope means what's the breadth? What's the breadth? What are you gonna cover? What's the scope of the book? Defining that. And then defining the sequence in which it will be covered. What comes first? You know, what comes second and so on. And those are important discussions to have. When I, when we worked with some of these instructors uh, in the last two years, they were working in teams. And we basically asked them to, again, we had them use sticky notes. And they, they had, they've taught these classes for a long time. They knew what concepts needed to be addressed. They together um, collectively just went through and, see, and, and defined all, here's all the things we need to cover. And then they sat down and sorted them into, into the sequence. And you're gonna have disagreements between instructors on that. And I give this example here. Um, I give this example of an OpenStax chemistry book that, that I believe was revised, uh, is Kathy in here? I believe it was re revised by uh, UConn uh, instructors, was my memory at least, sorry if I'm wrong there. Um, and they decided they wanted to teach the concept of atoms first behind, before other elements. And so they worked with OpenStax to actually move content around because they didn't agree with the sequence of the chemistry book as OpenStax had published it. So you're gonna get disagreement there, but, um, but it's important to agree on that up front. Okay, and then once you have that, basically you fit it into this structure that you've built, right? You have a book, chapter, section, and subsections, and, and you should, you work with them to work that out. It's, uh, um, I just said that in 10 seconds, it will take a long time to get this kind of pushed through, especially if there's multiple authors. Um, but you want to end up with a structure like this. And so I just yanked this out. This is the actual book structure, I believe, of the biology book of OpenStax. And so, uh, you know, here's unit two. Unit two is the cell. Chapter four is cell structure. Section 4.1, 2, 3, and so on. And then you can see here's unit three and so on. They have a book structure of book, unit, chapter, section at a high level. Once you have this structure, this content structure mapped out, and once you have this kind of element structure mapped out, you have everything you need to map out the whole book. And this is the piece I think that um, it, it's, this is kind of the magic of doing both of these things and then integrating them together. So if we look, for instance, at, let's look at this example. Um, Sorry, I hope you're not getting seasick on me uh, as I move the screen around. Uh, here are two chapters, chapter 11, chapter 12 of this textbook. Here is this, the element structure they agreed on before they wrote the book, right? This is, they have a book, chapter, section. This is what a book has in it. This is what a chapter has in it. And this is what the section is. This is the content structure, chapter 11 and 12. So if you combine these two structures, you can now say, all right, the very first thing in this book is gonna be the cover page, right? Here's the book structure. The next thing it's gonna have is a table of contents. It's gonna at the end have an index and a glossary. For each chapter, so here's chapter 11, there's gonna be an intro, objectives, and key terms. So you see that, here's chapter 11, intro, objectives, key terms. And then there's, in this chapter, there's two sections, and each section is gonna have the main content 
and it's going to have review questions. Here's section two, uh, 11.2, review questions or main content review questions. And then there's going to be discussion questions at the end of each chapter. So that repeats itself for each chapter, intro, objectives, key terms, review questions at the end. Uh, oh, I missed one, discussion questions at the end of the chapter. And then each section is structured the way a section is structured. So when you're done, when you combine these two structures, the content structure and the element structure, you end up with basically an outline of the whole book of everything that needs to be written. So that's what I said at the beginning when I said, uh, not only does this process help you end up with a better textbook that ensures that you use some of these elements and is more consistent, but it actually will help the instructor by, you know, their work is cut out for them now. They know exactly what they need to do. They need to write an introduction for this chapter 11. They need to write key objectives. They need to write key terms. They need to write the main content for section 11.1. They need to write review questions and so on. They, every, just go down the list. It's like a checklist. Um, so uh, when it comes down to it, um, what I, this, is, this is why we found it to be successful because writing a book can be an overwhelming task. It really can. It, it's just huge and it takes many months of time and any kind of structure that you can give that not only helps them, but ends up, end up, end up, end up ensures that you end up with something better than if you hadn't, um, you want to use that. And that's how we've, that's how we've, that's why we find this useful. I want to make a few just really simple um, notes here, uh, a few comments. When coming up with the structure, especially the content structure like this, like this, I made a note of it in here, in the text here. I want to, you should know that in 2012, there was actually a lawsuit. There were a number of publishers who, who, who sued Boundless and they sued Boundless, not because they copied the content of the books per se, but Boundless copied, or at least that's what they asserted, the structure of the book, the outline like this. What Boundless was trying to do, Boundless was trying to say this this commercial textbook over here look we have the same outline but it has open content in it so you can use this one to replace that one and it was a kind of a they were trying to say look this is equivalent to that one it should be an easy swap right and so it made kind of sense for them to try to, to just take the structure of the book and copy it up uh they were sued and so what was claimed basically was uh and there may be some on the line who know more about this than i do but uh, it was claimed that they claimed copyright on the structure of the book and that it was a copyright violation and so on. So uh, they settled. There was never any, uh, uh, there was never, it was never decided in court who was right and who was not. And can you actually copyright this kind of thing? Is this, how close is this getting to be copywriting facts, which you can't do? Um, it was, they settled. So unfortunately, we don't know what you can and can't do. But just be aware of that. It's something that if you're working with instructors, to make them aware of, so they don't just go to their book and say, I'm just going to, I'm just going to copy the outline of this book. Uh, they might think that that may not be a nice, easy way to get to where they want to go. Um, and even if they come up with it on their own, they're likely, it's likely going to be very similar to the book they just got done using. But just to make you aware uh, of that. Um, let's see, what else? Um, I, I guess you know, I, I would just then throw out um, a couple of caveats to this. Um, like I said, I don't know that, the, I know that this isn't gonna work for everybody. Um, this, I kind of put together because I work this way. I, when I write, I write an outline and I fill in the outline. Uh, my wife, on the other hand, she just writes. I don't know how she does it. And then when she's done, she rearranges it to a way that makes sense to her. So she actually ends up with the outline kind of in a way. Um, so again, I want to just point out that I'm not saying necessarily that this is the best case for absolutely everybody. 
Um, but it's a tool that we've found, a process that we've found uh, to be useful for many to give them the, to remind them number one, uh, we don't want to end up with a monograph. We want you to think about consistency and elements. And number two, um, we're going to help you structure this to make the job easier of writing. I think I'm probably ready to answer questions. Thanks, Dave. So we are ready for your questions or discussion. There's been an exchange in the chat. Thank you, Anita, for finding some uh, articles on the boundless um, lawsuit that Dave mentioned. So Paige has a question about whether you found an outline like this may work better for certain disciplines or areas more than others. Dave, I can't tell if you're thinking hard or if you froze. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm reading the I'm reading the chat. <laughs> oh. Well, I'm also. I, reading oh, 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 oh! I'm sorry. You were asking me a question. I was reading. <laughs> I you were asking anybody else a question. Um, no, I have no evidence to show that it's better for any other content areas than any other. A, a, a textbook is pretty much a textbook. If you're, if that's your aim. I think this structure would probably work similarly for anyone. It could have very little structure. They might decide, I just want book and chapter, and they want very few elements because they don't feel like uh, it would add pedagogically at all. Um, that's quite possible, you know? So it could be that some areas where there isn't quite as a, a, a need for quite as much stuff in there, mm -hmm. they could do that. It, it, it just would be a minimalist approach to this. So no, I don't have anything that points to specifics about content. And then related, Deb is asking, um, she's interested in more recently established disciplines that don't have consensus on fundamental concepts and mm -hmm. how that would impact this particular process. Well, that is a really good question and a question that's kind of outside of the scope of this because, but probably the hardest part of all of this. You know how I said that about, oh, they came up with this content structure and it sounds easy, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I can only imagine in the field of education, getting people together, even, and that's a much more well-defined field. It's not, it's been researched and talked about and studied and focused on for centuries. You still would, if you got five people in a room, they would all disagree on what you ought to be teaching in this education course. So that's a, that's a, a whole challenge in and of itself. Uh, the way that we worked on it um, uh, with some of these teachers, there were some multiple authors on, on some of these books is, um, you know, we just got them in the same room uh, went through the process of having them define what concepts, whatever level they want, high level, low level concepts, whatever it is, and write them all down on sticky notes, and then sat them down together and made them duke it out. And, and they sat there and they moved things around on the table and sticky notes and this and that, and they did agree and disagree on things. But eventually they, at the end of the day, they knew they wanted to get this done and they kind of settled. I'll put it that way. Well, you had a hard deadline on that project too, right? Yeah, that's right. It was a very short timeline, right? But they, I, I didn't need to push them. They actually did a, they actually came to some consensus pretty quickly on it. Okay, I'm gonna Hard. keep reading through the chat. Um, Matt mentioned a question about press books and wanting to go deeper into potentially um, other levels and subsections and then Naomi chimed in that press books just came out with a two level table of contents option um, just wanted to invite uh, a Perva or anyone else if they want to add anything on the press books front. Um, so yeah, people use that for open textbooks. I can chime on, in on that a little bit. Um, for those who don't know, I'm I was formerly the product manager at Pressbooks, and we still we share an office with them, so we know them quite well. Um, so as has been noted, right now uh, Pressbooks has a kind of a two level structure. Uh, so you have chapter, and then there's the ability to kind of define subsections. Um, and what Approva mentioned in the chat is there's some work happening at WordPress that's really interesting that might enable us to expand on that. Sorry, I still say us, but 
their mouth sending. <laughs> um, and, and so what the Gutenberg editor, which is the big, big change coming with WordPress, if anyone's aware of the work going on, what that does is it really breaks what in the Pressbooks context is a, context is a chapter into blocks. So very defined, uh, clear blocks of content, much like what Dave's been describing here. So that is kind of a, that's new added functionality that's really exciting when you're looking at in this context of, you know, not even, uh, you know, being able to break down a chapter into its smaller pieces and also to be defining what each of those pieces are. Um, so that is, that's a big, big project from WordPress and there are big implications for it, but it's something Pressbooks is keeping a really close eye on because we see the applications as, as, um, as we can kind of see here. I think it's, it's easy to make the connection between laying out a, a book and really dedicated pieces of content um, and, and then being able to replicate that and kind of leverage that in the Pressbooks context would be really interesting. So we're watching closely. Uh, and if, if anyone has more questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them offline. Thanks, Zoe. And two, if any of you prefer to unmute your mic and ask your question that way, you are certainly invited to do so. Um, I'm just going through the chat, um, but feel free to interrupt that uh, process at any time. So Deb also had a question about integrating multimedia into the text and the structural element. And I would think that that could certainly be a, a choice that the author makes or makes with the project manager. There's no reason why that maybe every chapter opens with a video, for example, um, a video introduction to that particular topic. I think that would be great. Uh, it's something I aspire for the for the curriculum that uh, we shared in this call. So Terry says, depending on the specific aspects of textbook structure that are subject to copyright, might OTN create a repository of openly licensed textbook structures? Um, and this is something we've talked a lot about in the co-op because um, we think it would be pretty helpful to sit down and have a starting point um, when project managers begin those conversations with authors after they've selected um, their projects to support. And so we are looking at doing something like that um, as well. So stay tuned. Uh, Jonathan uh, seconded it as an amazing idea. Um, I would not want to be too prescriptive, of course, like part of the process is uncovering um, your unique perspective on the subject and how you like to present information. And if you're thinking particularly of your student body and their needs, it really can take a lot of different directions, as all of you know. Um, Absolutely. Uh, just to follow up, Karen, I was thinking specifically around um, providing, uh, just to provide authors um, and project managers and all other stakeholders with options that are like really effective and that draw on all that genre and, and layout and all of the, the design aspects, but which can be created for this uh, and made open so that people can play with them and remix them without feeling like, uh, boy, is Pearson going to show up at my house in the middle of the night with a cease and desist order. Right. Thank you, Terry. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, we've encountered that before with people approaching a project. They sometimes just want to look at what else is out there, but do have this slight nervousness of not wanting to replicate mm -hmm. um, something like, like what happened in, in the Boundless case. Uh, so that just as a, as, a, as a prompt, as a resource for like, these are the kinds of things that could go into something that have been thought through, I think would be really, really interesting. And then Jim is wondering if there's any history buffs out there who know about the history of the textbook um, and when higher ed moved from treaties to textbooks. And he knows in econ, the first real textbook was Samuelson just post World War II. Um, Jim, I'm not brushed up on my textbook history, but um, a link I shared a little bit earlier, um, our partners in the co-op which is Scribe, um, the founder and CEO, David Reck, does a lot of reading on this topic. And I will admit, I did not um, cull his reading list, so it's rather long, but if you want to sift through it, there could be some um, books and articles there that dig into the history of the book and textbooks and um, could start getting at, at your question a little bit. And if it does, we'd love to hear back from you. 
And if I can chime in with a little bit of publishing nerdery, um, post-World War II was also a really kind of critical time for, uh, for journal publishing and monograph publishing and the kind of uh, formalizing and industrializing of that process. So I imagine, I don't know for sure, but I imagine it was kind of caught up in that similar process of, of uh, commercializing knowledge. I wonder too if, um, if outside of academia traditionally, like especially in the trades, um, uh, and technical fields, there might well have been, uh, like this seems like a very technically minded structure which uh, academia might be late to uh, and technical people not so much. So the plumbers may have been way out ahead of this. I certainly know the radio people were as early as like the 20s. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? Um, Jim, good to see you. Um, I, uh, I was in, uh, I was in Scotland. Well, it was right after I saw you and went and visited some castles up there. And when one of them, there was a textbook from the 18th century. I, I, I'm trying to pull up the images of it. And it was actually shockingly similar to, it was a math textbook and it was shockingly similar to what a textbook would look like today. It had problems in it. Yeah. I'll send you those photos. They're, they're kind of fascinating. If you can read old English. <laughs> um, okay. Let me, oh. Go ahead, Richard. Um, I've got one, one bit of comment for you and I can't find my video so I can't unmute myself. Um, as, a, as somebody who dabbles with print and printing history, there's a couple of other things that might be interesting. Uh, the post-World War II period is also, there we go. Ah, the post-World War II period is also the time uh, at which there's a technical technological shift from um, uh, letterpress to offset letterpress or offset uh, offset printing. So there's a techno there's a technological reason that you can add complexity to pages much more simply. Mm. Uh, it's not exclusive. Uh, the firm that I used to work for um, back at forever ago started off as an offset publisher the other the other thing that happens is is the, the ability to uh, of um, developing film setters in the 1960s which is another bit of technology so there's printing shifting but there's also compositional shifting in the way that plates are actually produced that happens um, oh I could probably look it up I think it's 1968 or 69 they, they start really taking off about them and at that point Wow uh, at that point, they are able to, uh, com compositors are able to um, change from a, from a text-based to a graphic-based um, production. So you actually look at the page as a, as a space that you can put different things on rather than as a line that you have to follow. So that just a couple of, a couple of bits and pieces. That really shifts in the late 1980s with the the creation of, of Aldous PageMaker and the first um, real uh, desktop publishing software. I'm sorry, I'll go away. I'm sorry, I think we should all get together and talk about the, the history of uh -huh. publishing. It's fun. <laughs> Great call. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of conversation in the chat too about it. So thank you all for sharing your uh, vast knowledge on the <laughs> <There you go. laughs> Um, and very appropriately, what we're now talking about is a new technology and how that's impacting uh, right. things. As, right. as, uh, as Dave said, a lot of this kind of thinking has come out of online courses as well. A nice parallel there. Yeah. Okay, so I'm uh, going to look back at the chat and just see if there are a couple other um, questions we can answer. So, Claudia, hello. It's been a long time. And nice to see you. Your question, when individuals are composing a textbook, do you also encourage them to consider development of supplementary materials or is this alt, is it too much at once? I love this question. Because there's two answers. <laughs> in my uh, mind. David. In the projects I've worked with, uh, supplemental materials were not part of the project that I worked on. And Karen, I don't know if you can say any more about what the cooperative is doing and 
We really wrestled with this question because we know it's such a big part of adoption decisions. People really look for those supplementary materials. I answer many questions about supplementary materials every week related to the open textbook library. But ultimately we did decide it was too much at once to make a requirement. Um, but I could imagine another um, proposal or another program deciding to require it and see how it goes. And maybe people out there have something to add um, based on their publishing programs. I certainly welcome any of you to chime in. Can I just add that in the Open Textbook Network, we, we had a work group that put together an amazing document about what they felt needed to be done with, with, with uh, these materials, these supplemental materials, because they are so important. And uh, we're going to be working towards that vision that they laid out. Um, but I, I, I think to some degree we're, we're a little behind on it, but we're in, because there are a number of things that need to be developed simultaneously. There's the technical side of it. Um, there's, you know, if you're writing a quiz bank, there's psychometric sides to it. You can't just write a quiz and, you know, there, there, are, there are valid questions and questions that really don't really help you learn and so on. So, oh, thank you, Karen. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of extra additional expertise that needs to be rolled into this and technological expertise as well. So, but it's, uh, it's important and the open community really needs to work on it if we're gonna catch up. Yeah, I can uh, speak very briefly about our experience at Rebus and the projects we've worked with have largely decided that it was out of scope, that they wanted to focus on content first. And in the few cases where that hasn't uh, happened, we have found it has affected the pace of work um, it has proved to be uh, distracting in a way <laughs> um, uh, and and so I think as as Dave said I think that it needs to be considered really carefully and and in a similar structured kind of way and really uh, um, done with the proper support and not kind of lumped in with what is already a really big project uh, that it needs kind of the space the time the effort that that is given mm -hmm. to the content as well mm -hmm. so a lot to work on there because it is critically important Paige has a question about any specific recommendations on the lengths of sections in a book. I don't, I'm afraid. Fair enough. I don't know if anyone else does. Yeah. I'm reading now. I think. Most of this chat that I'm reading about is related to the history of textbooks. <laughs> let, me know, let me know if I'm missing any questions to pose to Dave, please. Thanks, Jim. You really sidetracked us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I can chime in a little briefly on length of sections. Um, some uh, a purpose just uh, reminded me that some of our projects have looked at things like reading level um, and kind of considered uh, you know, that they're writing for an introductory course, and that's really been the guiding principle of how long they want the sections to be. Um, mm. And that's been really important in particular, I think our introduction to philosophy book is, there are many, many sections, there's a whole lot of authors, there's a lot going on. And so they've had to really pare themselves down to, I think the chapters were kept to 3000 yeah. words each. So well, that's not a section length, but yeah, and, and that uh, authors found that difficult, but it was a good tool to kind of keep it scoped. Um, to the, the particular audience that they were that they were writing for. Okay, I think that we've covered the questions that are in the chat so far, and we only have a few more minutes left. So if something is top of mind, please uh, unmute or type it in. I also would like to invite again, there are so many people on this call who have experience developing open textbooks, either as authors, or as project managers, librarians. So um, if you have feedback about this particular methodology or would like to share the methodology that you used, um, please, please chime in. This is the part where I pause and wait for chiming. Can I ask a question? Great. 
so th this was what I, I posted way early about about whether there's empirical whether there's studies about um, th these things. As I thought, as a, I mean, I've written a couple of, of open textbooks, and I wrote them to more like monographs because that's more what I was used to. And I, my students certainly have lots of complaints about lots of things, but I don't know that it was that particular thing. And I, so I, and when I've looked at the open textbook world, I mean, one of the things that like I look. You know, not to badmouth them, but I look at open, the you know, open stacks books, and they look like commercial books. And I think there's a strategy of theirs to sort of try to, you know, slide into what we're all familiar with, and but then, oh hey, look, it's open. That's great. And so I'm, I'm wondering. I just, I, the answer might be that I have to get more up to date. But is there real evidence that 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 all you know those, this for example, student learning outcomes is one of the things that learning outcomes you mentioned was one of the sections in the outline that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Do students ever actually look at those? I, I've seen no evidence that my students ever notice any of the other stuff than the text and the problems. Um, and and if one more wrinkle on this, the other thing I, I've noticed that in, in a lot of undergraduate classes, this is big, if you use a textbook, the students finish the class and they don't know how to read anything but a textbook. And you say, oh wait, we need to spend a semester in the senior year teaching how to read actual scholarly material in whatever discipline you're in and maybe we're doing them a disservice by not teaching them from the very beginning to read scholarly material and just yeah, put yeah. that out there sure no i would agree with i would i sympathize with those questions and and i uh i don't in any way would say that we ought to replace everything that students read with textbooks but there is a place for textbooks as well so it could be jonathan that what you're doing is uh, that whatever you're writing, I mean, you would know, you're the instructor, you would, you would know best whether what you write is working for your students. That I would leave it to you to make that judgment. And if it's more monograph like, or what, however you want to frame that, then it is. And um, uh, the reason we focus on textbooks uh, is simply because it's a place we can, we know we can make a difference and we know that there's a big problem. It doesn't mean that we believe textbooks are necessarily the solution to all problems or that that's what students should read. So I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I would agree with your questions. I don't agree with your questions. I don't know how that works, but I understand. Thanks. Can I toss out one more odd observation? My, my career in publishing, in, in tech, academic textbook publishing, as a matter of fact, broke across the shift from film setting to desktop publishing. It was really kind of a remarkable time to be, to be in the business. I noticed personally as somebody with an academic background that as soon as color printing became low cost opportunity, that the complexity of textbooks exploded. And that's where I think that you see a lot of uh, a lot of the, the mm. diverse elements because you could now put new design elements to them in right. ways that you could never do prior to that. Now, there's there, there's obviously that's not exclusively correct. Um, I think a really good model, if you're interested in following the way textbooks have evolved as graphic presentations, take a look at, at college algebra textbooks. Those, in many respects, because they have problems that were set in the text, and usually numbers and then, and then examples and whatnot, that tended to, to, to very quickly be the place where things diversified. Um, and then you went to two color textbooks. So you had you know, the black text with usually you know, a blue bar or something like that mm -hmm. over elements. And then you had three color textbooks, and then you had four and then five color textbooks where you, where you would put you know, teacher notes on one side of the edition that, that went along with the, the text. When you could start doing, you could do that all in, in hot metal, but nobody did it because it was enormously labor intensive. Right, right. When you started film setting and when you started desktop publishing, especially in the 80s, that's where you really see the big shift in the change. Mm. And the, the reproduction with uh, images as well was, it was a major, uh, a major change. Mm. Um, if I could hitchhike off of that, um, in a prior career, I was actually in strategic planning for paper and uh, the paper business and remember studying a lot of stuff in the 80s and 90s about uh, all the change in digital printing. And one of the things that struck us um, 
particularly because, you know, it, it, I mean, there was this giant wave of how litho and offset could do all this wondrous stuff in this high quality. And what was stunning was when desktop printing came along to find out, you know, really people just needed good enough color. They didn't need litho. They didn't need all that high quality stuff. And I wonder if there isn't an analogy here uh, on textbooks in the sense of the big publishers have all gone with fancy grandiose stuff. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not just structure, but it's also structure and color and layout and everything like that because they can now. Mm -hmm. And, and what I'm wondering is if we don't have a great advantage here with something like press books and now with, uh, you know, by having a, some common language about the, uh, structure like David's given us, um, I'm thinking we, you know, we need to decentralize this and, you know, what we need are good enough textbooks that are rapidly iterated. Mm -hmm. rather than, and, and perhaps this also applies to the ancillary problem. Like, I mean, I agree, quiz questions and stuff like that need to have, I mean, the goal is you want to get to the validity and, and, and stuff like that. But, you know, if we right. set out that the whole bank needs to be done first and totally verified before we iterate through it, we'll never get there. And of course, right. the reality is the big publishers don't validate their ancillaries <laughs> either, but... <laughs> well, right. that, I, I gotta, I gotta differ on that one just a little bit, Jim. And, and I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it's a little more complex. I remember my, in fact, I actually have a copy. Um, this was, this was my last that I happened to have a copy. And I, I one time counted up the number of people who had been involved in that that were named, credited, and there were over 150 people. Now there were only th three authors. But it was an entire village full of problem checkers and designers and um, verifying of various sorts. So, and I, yeah, they they pour money into it because they know they can get a return on investment. You know, the the first right. printing of this particular book was fifty thousand copies. You know, a, a standard academic book is like five hundred now, and dropping quickly. And clearly, we need to continue this conversation in future office hours. <laughs> I'm sorry to cut everyone short, but we are at time. And I really appreciate all of the experience, expertise, and knowledge that everyone here has brought to this conversation. It makes it really fun and exciting. And uh, we appreciate the input. As a reminder, this is related to a new open textbook publishing curriculum. I put the link in the chat again um, and would love if anyone wants to contribute a module on the history of the, of the textbook or some of the topics we've been talking about today, get in touch. Uh, it would be great to talk to you. Uh, thanks to our partners at Rebus, Zoe, Aperva, and everyone, and of course, to our guest speaker today, Dave Ernst. And uh, all of these sessions are recorded. They'll be on YouTube shortly and uh, stay tuned for a few more office hours in uh, the remainder of 2018. Okay, everyone, thank you and farewell. Thanks.